In our lab's beginning, back in the 1940s, Los Alamos was so secret that in some cases, it didn't even exist. Like on the birth certificates of the babies who were born here during the Manhattan Project era. These official documents just listed an address, P.O. Box 1663. I'm Bryce Steves from the Los Alamos National Laboratory's Public Affairs Office. You're joining me as we hear the stories behind some of the lab's most interesting pieces of history. Welcome to the Relics Podcast. It wasn't just a few records. Between 1943 and 1945, hundreds of young couples had moved to Los Alamos. They were among the thousands of Manhattan Project scientists, engineers, military members, and other staff creating the world's first atomic bombs. These young couples were also starting their families. More than 80 babies were born during that first year, and approximately 10 more babies arrived every month thereafter. This means about 300 newborns, give or take, had their birthplace listed as 1663 on their birth certificates. We have a copy of one of these unique birth certificates. It is a part of the lab's National Security Research Center. This is the lab's classified library. Here, collections containing millions of nuclear security materials are housed, along with unclassified artifacts. Fascinating finds are down every aisle and around every corner in the National Security Research Center. They include reminders that while people were here making history, they were also living their lives. Just like this 1663 birth certificate. My name is Alan Carr. Alan is a part of the National Security Research Center. He is Lanel's senior historian and is a foremost expert on the lab's annals. So at the beginning of 1943, there was not very much in Los Alamos. There was no uh, town here. There was certainly no laboratory. There was a school for boys in town known as the Los Alamos Ranch School. And uh, there were also some uh, some homesteads that had been uh, set up earlier in the 20th century. So you've got a few houses and properties, things like that. Again, the buildings for the boys' school, but not an awful lot. And early on uh, during the Manhattan Project, planners thought that the laboratory would not be very big. It would be, you know, Oppenheimer would be the director and there would be, you know, 100, maybe 200 scientists, something like that. Of course, the laboratory grew uh, far beyond that. I think that there were between six and 8,000 people by the end of the war who lived in Los Alamos. This secret cadre worked at the secret lab in a hastily created secret town. Laboratory space, homes, and amenities were quickly constructed. Much of the town's facilities looked like a military base. And, it was frequently noted, very muddy. Hardly any pavement had been laid. Their mission? To create the fat man and little boy atomic bombs. They would be released on Japan in August 1945, helping to end World War II just weeks later. My name is James Konetka. I am retired from the University of Texas, but I have spent about 40 years researching and writing about the history of Los Alamos during the war. Jim has also written four novels and three nonfiction books, one of which focuses on the partnership between Manhattan Project leader General Leslie Groves and lab director J. Robert Oppenheimer. It's called The General and the Genius. When I try to put Los Alamos in a historical perspective, I realized that we're actually talking about two places that existed simultaneously. There's Los Alamos, the laboratory, and this is the place where the bombs were designed and built. But there's Los Alamos, the community, and it was a community, and it grew and it grew, and young couples came and they had to learn how to operate without the benefit of lifelong friends or families. They had to make do. And they did. All of a sudden, you're getting several children born every month in Los Alamos. How do you keep that a secret? Well, one of the reasons, uh, or one of the ways that they kept that secret was on the birth certificates. You know, if you had paperwork coming through Santa Fe, the state capital, uh, about these births, and all of a sudden there's this this influx of Los Alamos kids, that's going to look awfully suspicious. And so uh, on the birth certificates, the, uh, the place of birth was not listed as Los Alamos. It was actually... Uh, the, the place of birth was 1663, uh, post office box 1663, Santa Fe, New Mexico, which in and of itself also looks suspicious, but at least it's not linked to Los Alamos. 
driver's licenses, death certificates, and incoming mail and deliveries, including a large quantity of bassinets ordered from Sears Roebuck, all listed the same location. Many of the staff traveled under aliases and pretty much everyone said their job was as an engineer, regardless of what they actually did. That came to define the community. After a while, as I interviewed people over the years, they reported, they got used to it and it became almost a joke. They would get inquiries from, from family. What is this P.O. box you live at? Don't you live in a house? And of course, they couldn't tell them that actually it wasn't just a P.O. box and it wasn't a P.O. box in Santa Fe. I'm looking at the copy of the birth certificate that is a part of the collections in the lab's National Security Research Center. All of the personal information has been redacted for privacy reasons, so we don't see the name of the mother, the father, or the baby. We do know, though, that it was a baby girl born at 8.55 p.m. on October 9th, 1944. And of course, her birthplace is listed as 1663. It looks like the father was a 23-year-old white male from Denver, Colorado. His occupation is listed as engineer. The mother was a 24-year-old white female also from Colorado, and her occupation is listed as housewife. It shows that this was the couple's first child. The birth certificate also lists some other basic information, such as the BB was given eye drops to prevent blindness, and it also notes that the mother was admitted to the hospital 30 hours prior to giving birth. And so I'm imagining this poor woman laboring for 30 hours while her husband, who may or may not have been an engineer, was out in the waiting room, maybe pacing or handing out cigars. Do we know what the maternity ward or hospital were like? As the number of people arrived and the number of couples arrived and the winter arrived and babies started arriving, what was probably just a simple building or maybe a part of a building that was in the beginning more like an infirmary, like you might find on a ship, able to deal with a broken arm or, you know, the flu or the usual run of non-life-threatening, uh, you know, ailments or accidents. Alan agrees. It would have been simple, but, you know, people, uh, people have made it happen in, in far worse circumstances than were available. We did have uh, adequate, at least adequate care for mothers and children during the war. Uh, certainly not ideal, but, uh, but adequate. Meanwhile, Manhattan Project leader General Groves was distraught. He asked Oppenheimer as the lab director to try to discourage the growing number of families. Oppenheimer, though, was in a tough position. He would not want to defy his boss, but Oppenheimer's wife Kitty was pregnant with their second child. And all of this turned into a big headache for General Groves because it was a distraction from the main work at hand, which of course course was to build uh, entirely reliable nuclear weapons as quickly as possible. Even as he was permitting what ultimately was two billion dollars, wartime dollars, for the overall Manhattan Project, he was actually rather stingy on the other level. He was hoping to keep the cost down. That was, that was one aspect. The other is the larger Los Alamos became, the more prone or more susceptible to, to sabotage to a break in security. And that, he felt, the more families that came and the more babies that happened, you would require more outside. You'd need more doctors, you'd need more nurses. We don't know an exact date as to when 1663 was no longer used on official documents. Most likely, this practice stopped shortly after World War II ended. That was on September 2nd, 1945. With the advent of the bombs, the world knew that the lad had accomplished one of the greatest scientific achievements of all time. There was no longer a need to keep Los Alamos a secret. Although a true relic of the lab's past, no doubt having a four-digit number for your place of birth also raised questions as these Manhattan Project babies went through life. I would not be surprised at all if it caused um, a few headaches for some of these kids along the way. but. In return for uh, the potential headaches, you get this really cool story about, uh, you know, about your early days, how you were born into history's most secret project. And, uh, you know, I think I'd take that trade. I think that's pretty cool. 
Relics is produced by Los Alamos National Laboratory. Joey Montoya is producer. Bry Steves is writer and host. Additional thanks to Andrew Gordon, Chris C. DeBaca, Lexi Petronas, Joe Gonzalez, Riz Ali, and Scott Falk.